Well, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to KG5. Um, we're really proud, really proud to host uh, ESF TEDx um, and to celebrate the 50th anniversary of this great organisation that we call ESF. My name's Mark Blackshire and I'm the new principal of KG5. This is my first TEDx event and I'm very excited because I've only been in Hong Kong for 11 weeks or 12 weeks. So really exciting things are happening for me and for the school and for ESF. So it's great to be here and so, so good to see parents and guests, students and teachers and alumni um, here today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also our presence of our ESF CEO, Belinda Greer. Great to see you, Belinda, and she'll speak to us shortly. Our Director of Human Resources, Charles Caldwell, and Charles is actually going to deliver a keynote, so that'd be fantastic. And our Director of Advancement, Terry Apel. Um, great to see um, ESF here today. Um, a special thank you to the people who are actually going to speak. Um, I think they're a bit crazy, mad, smart, all the above. But anybody who volunteers to come to a public speaking event um, I think is a bit special, so um, I really thank them for their courage and representing the KG5 Lion Courage that, that um, lurks in this place. I think you show great courage to come up here. Um, we know that this room will be full of ideas worth spreading, and that's what we're looking forward to hearing today. So to lay the foundation for today, I'd like to play a short TEDx video. From Kenya to Colombia, from Iraq to Korea, in slums, in schools, in prisons, and in theatres. Every day, people gather at TEDx events around the world to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. Today, you are part of a global conversation about our shared future. So what is this TEDx? TEDx is an initiative of the TED Conference, a nonprofit devoted to ideas worth spreading. We grant free licenses to allow TED-like events to spread globally. This event today is based on the TED conference format and ideals, but is independently organized by your local community. So please make sure to thank the team of volunteers who worked so hard on today's event. It's their ideas, dedication, and time that made it all possible. It's they who booked all the speakers. And the views you'll hear today are, of course, those of those speakers, not necessarily of TEDs. But we hope their talks spark an exciting conversation among you. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for openness and for critical thinking, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you'll take out. And now, on with the show. Okay, on with the show. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome our CEO, Belinda Greer, to um, have some opening remarks. Please make Belinda feel welcome. Thank you, Mark. And I've been given very strict instructions to stand in one spot and not move about too much. Um, can I please add my words of welcome to you all to this um, ESF 50th anniversary TEDx um, talk inspiring innovation. Now yesterday's innovation is today's reality. But what determines the ideas that make it, the ideas that are adopted? What determines the ideas that successfully bring about change? Today we're going to hear from five presenters who are going to talk about inspiring innovation. They're going to share their ideas. And when you think about the real challenge that they face, how did they get across their ideas to us that could perhaps spark some change? Now, they're having to talk under strict regulations, time constraints, and that's no easy feat. If you think about your concentration span, take your age and multiply it by two minutes. So if you're five years old, you've got a concentration span of around 10 minutes. If you're 10 years old, your concentration span's about 20 minutes. Now I'm looking around the audience, I'm probably the oldest person here, and you're multiplying your age by two thinking, wow, can I really concentrate for that long? Well, I hate to tell you, once you reach the age of 15, 
30 minutes, it's all downhill. So for people like me, we're heading back down to the five-year-old with the 10-minute concentration span. So having the time, time constraints really good. So that keeps the audience with you. But as Mark said, to actually stand up, put yourself on the stage, to have that courage to give your ideas and to keep the audience with you takes real courage, takes real skill. Now, the words of Mark Twain come to mind. Mark Twain said, if you want me to give a two-hour presentation, I'm ready today. If, however, you want a five-minute speech, I will need two weeks' preparation. So I just want to acknowledge the preparation that I know will have gone in to these TEDx um, talks that we're going to hear today. Keeping your audience with you, engaging your audience is really important. And I would like to share a story with you. Some advice I got from someone that you may have heard of, Gordon Brown. Now, Gordon Brown was the Prime Minister of the UK. And he happened to be a local councillor in the authority where I was a principal. And Gordon Brown told me this story one time and it has stuck with me. He said, when I was a young politician, I was really eager, really keen. And I was invited along to speak to a group of councillors. And I was really passionate about what I was going to be speaking about. And I went to the meeting and I was introduced, first item on the agenda, and I got started. And I had eye contact. Everybody was nodding. He thought, this is great. They're really interested in what I'm saying. But after a five minutes, obviously we're very old people, they started to lose concentration. And then they started to roll their eyes. And then they even started to close their eyes. And he realized, I am losing this group. I am losing my audience, but I'll keep going. And he did. He got to the end and the chairman said, okay, so we'll just close the meeting now. We'll defer the other items. We'll pick them up next time. And people left without thanking him. And he said to the chairman, what happened there? He said, you know, I knew my brief. I've come along, I've shared all my, my thinking. And the chairman looked at me and he said, we asked you to come along to speak. And he said, yes, I was asked to come along and give a presentation for 45 minutes. He said, four to five minutes. So keeping it succinct, keeping it brief, keeping your audience with you, it might look easy, but it's not. I just want to thank our presenters for being prepared to step onto the stage. But I also want to thank you for being prepared to come along and be the audience. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the spe speeches. Thank you. Thank you, Belinda. You had me worried for a second there because I thought I was working out in my head I had to have a concentration span of 104 minutes. And my wife reckons I can last four minutes of concentration. So thank you for clarifying halfway through that that's not true. I don't know what to... So now it's not 104 minutes. So first speaker, uh, I'd like to introduce Anna Champion. Uh, Anna's currently a partner with KG5, uh, a community partner. Anna's life has re revolved around developing emerging talent. Her passion lies in um, seeing people realise their potential as individuals. Her corporate life uh, um, is primarily focused on recruiting and developing people at the beginning of their careers. She's had experience in legal profession and in global investment banking. Anna currently supports universities across the globe and their career pro in their career programs, as well as working with many graduate employees through our company, The Talent Lighthouse. Really looking forward to hearing the story and uh, hearing, hearing firsthand from Anna Champion. Please make a welcome. Before I start my presentation, I'd like you to take a moment to think about what success really means to you. Neither of my parents went to university. In fact, my father hardly completed his high school education at all. Yet that didn't change the fact that when I was at school, I knew that going to university was integral to my success. 
After all, with a good degree from a university, you're going to be highly employable. My brother is incredibly intelligent. When I've been practicing, I've said was intelligent, but he's still intelligent now. And he was the sort of person that would go to a Shakespeare play at an early age and laugh at all the jokes first. Whereas I would be sitting behind the scenes, waiting for everybody else to laugh. Then I'd laugh along, because obviously it was funny, but I wouldn't understand any of it. He was also the sort of person that academically would get amazing reviews from, from his uh, teachers. Paul is an amazing talent. He has taught us more this year in English than we've taught him. I, on the other hand, was good at everything, but not excellent at anything. And following in his footsteps was really hard. One thing puzzled me as I was growing up, and that was that my grandmother always used to say to me, Anna, I don't worry about you in the future, but I worry hugely about your brother and where he'll end up. For me, that was such an enigma. He was the academic one. He was the one doing well. Yet for me, I didn't feel I was quite as successful academically, yet still she thought I would do better in the future. I can remember when I was about 12, running home from school, so excited that I'd come 11th out of a group of 120 students in a maths exam. My mum probably said a huge amount of positive things to me, yet she made one throwaway comment, and that comment was, it's a shame you didn't cut in the top 10. All of a sudden, the success that I was feeling for getting in the top 11, or top, becoming 11th, suddenly I felt like I was a bit of a failure. I still remember that. My mum doesn't remember that conversation at all. And I know because I've asked her and talked to her about it and held her accountable to it. Let's fast forward a little bit. So I did go to university, and I did go to one of the Russell Group in the UK, and I did come away with a degree. I also had a whole load of things on my CV that people had told me would look good. Yet still, I found it impossible to get a job. Whatever reason it was, I couldn't just get through the recruitment process. Possibly, I felt like I hadn't achieved everything that I wanted to do, and I felt a bit of a failure. But I did get a job in the end, of course. And unfortunately, though, I didn't get paid a lot. Compared to my peers, they were off on uh, planning fantastic holidays, dining at lovely restaurants, um, and I was barely covering, covering my rent. To make matters worse, Although I was working in a professional services firm, the people that I was hiring, because I was graduate hiring, were actually earning double the amount that I did, despite maybe going from a lesser university and maybe not getting as good degree as I did. I felt a bit of a failure in comparison to my peers and in comparison to the people that I was hiring. It was made worse by the, the students that I was hiring turning around to me and saying, did you fail at being a lawyer? Is that why you're in HR? <laughs> Suddenly, the professionalism and the success that I thought I had was being pushed away. And I did feel a bit of a failure, although now, looking back, I know how much I, that job meant and how good it was as a starting point. So let's fast forward to now. There are many times I have conversations with my friends around trying to meet up. Sometimes it takes us about three months to find a spot in the diary that we can meet up. Somehow, we all believe that being busy is a good thing. And we compete with each other who's the busiest. When did success become being busy and that you can't do the things that you want to do, like have dinner with friends? So what is success? Well, I spent a bit of time researching with my friends. It's actually the best Facebook post I've ever posted. I got the most amount of responses. Everybody likes to think about success, and these are some of the things that they put down. Maybe you can see up there some of the things that you feel are success as well. 
Interestingly, not one of them mentions academic success, money or status, or being busy. Yet these are the things that on a day-to-day -day basis, we consciously or unconsciously are telling our children that that's what success is about. That's what our society is showing. How often do you sit down and talk to people about what success really means to you? So what can we do? Well, interestingly, one of the things is already happening for us. The generation coming out of university, those are the kids that were born from 1995 onwards, and contrary to popular belief, are not millennials, but Generation Z. They are in our schools, they're in our universities, and they are now in the workplace. But interestingly, they think a little differently to how we think, and definitely think a little bit differently to millennials. They are hardworking, they are realistic, and they, but they are questioning how we have worked. They know success isn't always around being chained to your desk. A recent Accenture study actually found that over 50% of those, study, uh, those um, asked were actually would choose a job that was a nice and uh, happy environment over one that was going to pay them well. Despite being digital natives, they also are willing to take some time away from social media. They get fed up of being subject to other people's narratives. And therefore, they like to live in the moment. So by walking away from social media, they are allowing themselves to do that. So we'll, we've got a society where this is happening a little bit for us. So what can we do to help support this um, rather than squash these great ideas? Well, firstly, as employers, and I'm sure many of you are employers, you can look at beyond the academics. Most employers that I speak to, the first point of reference they make and judgment they make about a student, is the, an applicant, is their university grades, their GPA. Fortunately, there are some companies out there in the UK and in the US who've now taken away the GPA rate. And that is because they understand that academic success does not necessarily mean success in the workplace. We are starting to see a little bit of that here in Hong Kong. Companies such as HSBC and Diageo have now taken away CVs from the application process. But we need to do more around it. We need to support the idea that to be future ready, we need to ensure that we're not just focusing on academic skills. There is much more out there. As a recruiter, I have spent many times where people have talked to me about their application. They can tell me very well about their academics, and in many cases, they have exemplary academics, that there's something that I could never achieve myself. Yet, they can't tell me why they've chosen to do the degree that they wanted to do, that they've done. They can't articulate anything more than that. So as employers, it's our responsibility to show that there is much more that we're looking for than just academics. Secondly, as educators, be that parental or academic educators, we need to encourage the population that are coming out of schools and into, and into universities and into the workplace to know that it is more than just academic success. To do that, we need to talk to them about their own narrative. What is it that makes them different? And I know that not everybody is exceptional. You're not all going to be Olympic swimmers, but you have your own story to tell. We've all been through experiences, and rather than just collating things that will look good on our CV, we need to be talking about what's happened, so what have they learned from that experience, what obstacles have they overcome, what challenges have they faced, and what successes have they achieved. 
by doing this, we will enable them to feel comfortable with who they really are. People hire individuals. They do not hire pieces of paper. And that is really very important that we take that away, particularly in Asia, where academics have been so important for so long. And it's for that reason that I believe that we all have a role in, taking and in helping support and encourage individuals to think about what their th to be able to articulate their story, to understand it, and then to go out there and own that story. That is where they will gain success, not through just their academics. And hopefully that success will be whatever their success they would like it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, a couple of takeaways for me. Wasn't it great to hear Generation Z not getting bashed up for a change and being promoted and talked about so positively? And a round of applause for that, I reckon. Um, secondly, um, I love that saying, be future ready. Um, and I guess that's the fundamental business blender we're in, isn't it? To make our kids future ready. And the idea of um, owning your own story. Um, and I spoke to our students today about brand, their brand and how they promote their brand and what makes them different and marketable and, and the fact that we've got a job for life, they'll have a job for the life of the project, all that sort of concept. So really wonderful stuff. So interesting to hear your story. I think we have a really valuable certificate to hand you. Is that right? Under the special drawer. There we go. So Anna, would you like to come forward and accept that on behalf of us? So thank you very much. Give Anna a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Anna. Okay. Speaking of Generation Z, I'm not sure whether our next speaker is in Generation Z or not, but I'd like to welcome and introduce Kevin Dokal. Uh, Kevin is currently a Year 11 student at ESF Sharting College. Uh, Kevin has a passion for robotics and is part of the 2017 school robotics team. Uh, Kevin's uh, hobbies include uh, coding, video editing, photography and web development. I've also heard on the grapevine that Kevin is a mean badminton player. Is that true? It, well, there you go. Please give Kevin a round of applause. Failing is certainly not a prerequisite for success, but is getting it right the first time really the way entrepreneurs uh, succeed in real life? Not all. Jack Ma, founder of Alibaba, failed a key primary school test two times, failed his middle school test three times, and later on scored less than 10% uh, on the math sections for his college entrance exam. To be fair, if that were me, McDonald's would probably be the future I'd be looking at. But for Jack, KFC didn't even want him. Out of all 30 jobs he applied for, he was rejected by all of them. But despite these countless setbacks, that didn't prevent him from, achi from achieving his dream, creating his own business. In 2001, he and his company went to America to uh, raise venture capital. They tried to raise three million, but in the end they failed. Whether investors would regret that nowadays, we'll never know. But Jack jokes about it, as in 2014, he went back to raise just a bit more, 25 billion. Personally, this is one of my favorite underdog stories. I mean, if someone like Jack, a nobody with no money, no business experience, or any coding ability, be the founder of one of the world's largest e-commerce website, why can't we achieve just something as great as that? For the most of us, that reason is fear. Whilst it may not seem obvious, fear is one of the main reasons why we regret so much. 
we regret not participating in certain events and constantly doubt what would have happened if we just simply did it. In the world of, in the industry of innovation, that is pretty much the same. Ideas, the fear of failure is one of the main reasons why ideas aren't realized. So many ideas are trashed and potential is wasted. I mean, if everybody just learned and embraced failure, how great could this world be? To be honest, everyone in this room has the potential of being a great innovator. Not everyone is ready for it though. Some believe that they don't have the intelligence to do it. Others believe that they don't have what it takes to be a leader. But does it really, do you really have to be a genius to be a successful innovator? I mean, look at these guys. Elon Musk, Jack Ma, and Li ka -shing. Were they geniuses? I mean, sure, maybe they were. But the thing is, they were geniuses of hard work. They weren't afraid of failure. I mean, most of them have, have met failure countless times, yet just raised and, and went beyond that. For example, Elon Musk. In December 2008, after the economic crash, Tesla was two weeks away from bankruptcy. But despite this huge wall set in front of him, Elon Musk did not give up. He stayed. He wasn't afraid of failure. And that's how this miracle came by. A automaker company called Daimler um, invested $50 million in them, and that's how Tesla grew to become the company we now know. Being afraid is not useful at all, full stop. It prevents us from seeing the big image as a whole and achieving our full potential. Yet if you ask the average person why they haven't achieved their dreams yet, the fear of failure is, will always crop up as one of the main reasons. Well, if the fear of failure is just so unproductive, then why does it feel instinctual? Why does it feel like every time there's failure right in front of us, we must avoid it? Well, the thing is, we weren't born to fear failure. When we were in infants, every time we fell down, our parents would encourage us to get back up, and so we did. It's through this constant repetition of failure that we just learned the basic skill of walking. So then if we weren't born to fear failure, then when exactly do you think we learned it? Anybody? Correct. Hmm? Just like any phobia, we weren't programmed to fear failure. Instead, we were raised to fear it at an early age. In primary, getting the right answer the first time was often met with praise, with, with praise. And on the other hand, getting the answer wrong was often met with low grades, scolding, or even content from uh, teachers and peers. With social acceptance being one of the most important aspects of a student's life, the fear of failure is then unconsciously trained throughout primary to college. So now we understand what fear is, its origin and purpose. Why exactly should we fear fear? Should we fear failure? Sorry. Well, to be honest, we don't exactly have a reason. I mean, ig ignore the fact that the reason why we fear failure is because we want to be socially accepted. We actually don't have much of a reason to fear failure. Instead about worrying about the present, we should look into the future and see that failing is actually a great teacher. With the right mindset, we can learn so much from failure. While success makes us feel invulnerable, failure makes us learn important lessons. The greater the magnitude of the failure, the more likely we'll be able to remember that lesson. 
And that's why when you leave this room, I want you to do something. I want you to try something new. Find your passion. I mean, when you go back home, literally, if you don't have a passion, just do this. Spend one minute writing down as many things as you can, like and anything you want to do. And from there, choose five and make them your goal. Want to try teaching? Well, just go teach English in your local community. Want to learn programming? There are courses online for you to do. But whatever you do, don't fear failure. And if you do that, I promise you, you'll be one step closer to success. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Great effort, young man. A couple of things resonated with me. The first one was fear causes regret and made me think about the times there I regretted things. It wasn't what I did, but what I didn't do. I don't know whether people feel the same way. Some was, I wish I had done that, I wish I had done that, not the mistakes I made. So great point. The second one was everybody has potential to be an innovator, I thought was, was a really powerful statement. But what I loved, I felt like sometimes was my granddad standing up there talking about the old-fashioned values. You know, you work hard, you're resilient, you're determined. It's really great to see the, the values that we all know coming back and are alive and well in this generation in terms of their achievement. And tonight, you've given me something to think about. I'm going to go home and look in the mirror, Kevin, and see whether I'm a chunk of randomly assembled molecules or I'm actually a real man and tell my wife I'm not afraid of her and then I'm going to run away, okay? So uh, thank you for giving me things to think about, about my fear, um, which is my wife. Not really. Okay. <laughs> Next speaker, I believe. I'm um, really looking forward to this one. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, Kevin, certificate. You want to come out the front? Can we give young Kevin another round of applause? Our third guest speaker uh, tonight is our ESF HR director, Mr. Charles Corwell. Uh, Charles is a Hong Kong local since uh, 1996 and is a proud Canadian, loves maple syrup. Is that right? Yes. Of course he does. He's a Canadian. Family man and is also an accomplished sailor. Uh, Charles is, uh, loves the outdoors. In a couple of weeks, Charles is participating bravely, I think, in the Hong Kong fastest executive race, which is a 13-kilometer uh, cross-country uh, running race to raise money for Room to Read charity. Um, as a 16-year-old, Charles started his own career as an entrepreneur and has grown a deep passion since then for leadership, culture, and well-being issues. Charles has also been uh, interested in neuroscience and the plasticity of the brain. Charles is speaking at the upcoming Asia-Pacific International Schools Conference in December. And his title is How to Shift Growth Mindset from a Learning Environment to a Leadership Environment. Please welcome Charles Corbell. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Can everyone hear me OK? OK, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, great. When you look into your heart, what do you see? Several weeks ago, I was standing in a lift going up to a business meeting with a colleague. And on the walls of the lift were the TVs with the headlines of the day floating by. And the headlines were, of course, about leaders out there in the world who were fighting with one another, accusing each other of doing certain things, and then other leaders batting back with similar accusations back and forth. I stood there and I looked at these headlines. My colleague did as well. And I said to him, you know, the whole world needs to take a deep breath. There was a stranger in the elevator, and she turned around, and she said to me, wow, isn't that the truth? And we all laughed and chuckled as if it was funny. But clear as a bell, the message rang inside that elevator lift. Now, around the world and throughout my career, I have seen leaders act in a variety of ways that actually are quite appalling. Uh, right now, some of the biggest modern leadership issues we have are inflated egos, low emotional intelligence, fixed mindset and unwilling to be flexible, and what I would call failure nexus, which I think you heard in our last talk. And that is a weak relationship to failure, which leaders absolutely need. We've seen behavior in leaders which has been narcissistic, self-centered, overly controlling, and quite shocking. Why would this be? 
Well, in business schools and in political systems and in many business institutions, we're taught to think with our head, to focus on the bottom line, to focus on the results, and not to think with our heart. And what's happened is we've actually trained leaders to live out of a part of the brain called the sympathetic nervous system. And it's in the sympathetic nervous system that the amygdala lives. The amygdala is a part of the brain that controls emotions and controls threat and uh, f uh, flight fight response when a human being is confronted with a lot of stress. The term amygdala hijack was coined by Daniel Goleman in many of his books on emotional intelligence. And that is when emotion overpowers reason and an individual has a outburst of emotions, usually seen in a form of some sort of rage or anger, channeled at an individual or channeled at a group of individuals. That is an amygdala hijack. You may have experienced one yourself. But the problem is that around the world, the confidence in leadership is eroding. The World Economic Forum in 2015 issued their leadership survey, which showed that globally there was a worldwide leadership crisis. And two years later, consulting firm Edelman explained in their trust barometer that around the world there is a significant decline in leadership confidence in almost all areas of countries, in all areas of government, corporations, NGOs, and institutions. But meanwhile, when you look out in the environment, the glass is actually not half empty when it comes to leadership. Operating with humility, there are many, many leaders who are out there actually being quite effective and gliding their way through life in quite an amazing way. They have a certain type of magical demeanor about themselves, which is really quite extraordinary. And after interacting with one of these leaders, you walk away with a sense of tremendous empowerment that they're really, really interested in you. And you ask yourself, after they may have said something to you or someone else, wow, why didn't I think of that thing to say? Or why is that? Well, they work in a certain magical domain. Take, for example, Satya Nadella. He is the current CEO of Microsoft. 25 years ago, in Hyderabad, India, he joined Microsoft. 25 years later, a quarter of a century later, he is now the CEO of Microsoft. And he has led Microsoft to some extraordinary results. This past year, Microsoft had a 35% increase in their share price, which was the highest increase in their share price in the 31 years that they've been listed as an organization. He's also brought more openness and transparency to Microsoft. What is Nadella's secret superpower? Well, we see leaders operating with this type of magical demeanor. And we, start, we see them entering into a zone that many of us find very, very uncomfortable. We might find them comfortable in our families, but we find them uncomfortable in work. And this is the zone of practicing love as a leadership skill. Now, for many people, it seems kind of odd for leaders to practice love as a leadership skill in the work environment. After all, I'm in human resources, and if I went around telling all my colleagues, I love you, I love you, I love you, they'd think I'd lost my mind. And they probably would not welcome many, many hugs from me, especially since I, live in, I work in human resources. But the point is that there are ways to practice love as a leadership skill, which are really quite subtle. So take, for example, where did we learn from, where did we learn our models of love? We all learned our models of love from growing up as a child or growing up as a teenager. In those formative years, we learn about love. What sort of family did you come from? Perhaps you came from a family that was very physical and was very, very demonstrative. Then you would have learned about love and you being a certain way, you'd be able to point to it, you'd be able to see a hug, and you would be able to say, that is love. But maybe you came from a family or a culture where love was not expressed in a very, very clear way. Maybe love was expressed by your parents driving you to a very early morning football game where you had a practice, or maybe sending you the link to a newspaper article online, or perhaps even when you phone them up on the phone, they talk to you about the weather. As odd as it may seem, that could be how your parents express love. Similarly, 
And ironically, when leaders in the business environment practice love as a leadership skill, they practice it inconspicuously in a very, very subtle way. Now, this is in stark contrast to traditional models of leadership. Traditional models of leadership, the leaders who are self-centered and egotistical with low emotional intelligence, are all about getting ahead and pushing people down. But on the other end of the leadership spectrum, we have leaders who practice love as a leadership skill, who are all about serving others and serving their people. What does this actually look like in the world? Well, it really looks like practicing empathy, practicing what we call professional inti intimacy, which the research shows is the key, most compelling trait of practicing love as a leadership skill, practicing professional intimacy and empathy with your teams. And it doesn't have to be limited to the work environment. It could be with the teams that you work in, uh, on, your f on your sports teams, uh, your friends that you hang out with. All of these are ways to practice love as a leadership skill, really getting to know people in a professionally intimate way. Now, if we look at the research behind this, Christine Bodke in Australia looked at 5,700 individuals in about 77 organizations, and she looked at what was the correlation between practicing love as a leadership skill and impacting productivity and profitability. And what she found was that empathy and empathetic and compassionate behavior amongst leaders was the number one correlation to impacting profitability and productivity. A similar uh, study was done by DDI, uh, which is a huge global training company. They looked at uh, thousands and thousands of individuals in about 300 companies, 20 different industries, in about uh, 20 countries, and 18, uh, 18 to 20 different industries. And what they found was the same thing. The key differentiator was practicing leadership as a love skill and being able to listen and respond with empathy to your staff and your team. So what does this actually look like? How do we practice professional intimacy? Well, it involves really getting to know people. And when people have setbacks in their jobs, understanding the type of burden that might be on their shoulders and not dismissing them. It also involves celebrating wins. And when the team has a win, often passing those wins on to the team so that they can celebrate them. And that's an act of humility that leaders can actually practice as well. All too often, we see leaders taking wins and taking credit for the win. But when you practice love as a leadership skill, you actually pass on the win to your team and have them celebrate that particular win, win and share in the success. Practicing professional intimacy also can uh, involve random acts of kindness, uh, going out of your way to look after pe people and to care for people in very, very unique ways, unique ways that may be foreign for the average day's technological day and age. So about four to five years ago, I started sending out notes to staff throughout ESF with a certain regularity to that. And over the course of four to five years, I've now sent out over 2,500 personal handwritten notes to ESF staff. And that is part of my journey and what's impacted me in how I've traveled um, through understanding leadership as a love, um, as a love as a leadership skill. And this is uh, what I call pouring love into ESF. Practicing love as a leadership skill also involves being willing to apologize when something goes wrong, not trying to blame the team, but willing to accept, accept responsibility when something goes wrong, and uh, being willing to uh, share in the responsibility when there are mishaps and failures. This concept of practicing love as a leadership skill, practicing professional intimacy, and having empathy for people in your workplace is becoming so well entrenched. The body of research is really growing significantly, but it's become so well entrenched, it's reached a point where there is actually an organization called the Empathy Business that tracks empathy in organizations. And here you find a list of the top 10 empathetic companies in the, organ in, uh, in the world. What I would like to point out to you is Southwest Airlines. After 9-1-1, Southwest Airlines did a very, very unique thing. The entire planet's airplanes were grounded, 
and North America, United States, was grounded for several, several days. And during that time, many, many airlines went into retrenchment action and started to plan how they were going to reduce staff and how the 9-11 was going to impact their budgets and was going to impact their revenue. Well, that's not what Southwest What's not what Southwest Airlines did. What Southwest Airlines did is they instructed their staff to go out and find stranded passengers and to take them to movies, take them to dinners, take them bowling, take them to activities as a way to empathize with the fact that they'd been separated from their families and that everybody was hurting from the 911 uh, terrorist attack. Now that is really a caring company. And those types of actions, going out and finding customers and empathizing with customers and taking them out to do social things is a great example of practicing love as a leadership skill. Now, if you're not convinced by the research, perhaps you'll be convinced by the neuroscience. In a part of the brain called the, uh, front, well, the frontal, part of the frontal lobes of the brain, scientists have discovered mirror neurons and the mirror neurons actually tell us, when you look under the hood, that human beings are wired to empathize with one another. And what this would look like is if you were watching, if we were all watching a rugby game right now, and somebody got tackled very, very badly, and we all had this sort of united, oh, as we watched somebody get crunched by a hard tackle, that feeling that we would all have, the way we would all sort of shift, the way we'd all sort of crunch, and the way we all might have even an experience of a little bit of pain or some sort of stimulus inside us is an example of our mirror neurons empathizing with the rugby player that we had seen in the game just get badly tackled. I'm sure you've probably experienced that at some particular time. But similarly, scientists have also looked at the parasympathetic nervous system of the brain. And in the parasympathetic nervous system, this is where the body learns to relax. So while the amygdala gets us to wind up and to fight or to flee from situations, the parasympathetic nervous system gets us to relax. And what scientists have discovered is that when people are practicing acts of random acts of kindness or practicing acts of love as a leadership skill, that the parasympathetic nervous system actually lights up. And when it lights up, it's not lighting up with fear. It's actually lighting up with good things. It's actually sending a signal that the body is benefiting from practicing these particular skills. Whether we're giving or receiving these particular skills, but especially when we're giving the skills to others and leading others in this particular way is when the parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated the most. You need to love one another. A famous lieutenant colonel several years ago in Afghanistan was talking to a 1,000 soldiers who are about to go out and start clearing IEDs from the streets of Afghanistan. And what he said to them was, you need to love each other. That was very, very foreign for them to hear. But after explaining the concept to them, they actually got used to the idea that while they were out there carrying, their job, carrying out their job, clearing away potentially explosive devices, that they really had to love one another and look after each other and care for one another. And that's the message behind practicing love as a leadership skill. I invite you to look into your heart and to see where you can practice leadership with more love today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, very insightful. Uh, I like the opening thing about take a breath. We have a saying where I come from and it says, why don't you just calm your farm? So I don't know whether that's the same thing. Take a breath and calm your farm. But I think take a breath and slow down um, really resonated with me. And the other thing, I, when you started talking about leaders and you said all our leaders in the world, a lot of them are really big egos, low IQs and fixed mindsets and don't really engage with failure. I can think of a couple in particular, but I won't say that because that's political. But thank you for, for that as well. And then what I liked when you talked about love, I sort of get, felt a bit uncomfortable, Charles, to be honest. But when you actually started talking about practical examples of you know, letters and notes to people and, and just a sense of appreciation because so many people in our organisations work so hard but we get so busy, we just need to stop and acknowledge them and I think that really came in, in well. And lastly, before you go, I want a hug. I'm getting a hug from Charles. Have your cameras ready? I'm getting a hug from Charles. And I hope, I hope that's it. Okay, we've got a break now.
Um, we're going to come back in about 15 minutes. So it is 5-2, five 5-5. Two, five to five. So at 10 past 5, we're back here again. I'm really excited about one of our next speakers at KG5. And also I'm getting signals from the back from somebody who I really appreciate, and that's Yaz, and it's telling me I've got to hand a certificate out to Charles. Thank you, Charles. It's a love note, yes. I've actually scribbled a little message on the back. Charles will find that later. Okay. Um, so I'll see you back here at um, five. Is what I say? Yes? Uh, sorry, ten past. Ten past five. Thank you very much. So we show our love at this school, not by hugs, but with food. So I hope you had uh, had some lovely food out there. Um, we've got two more guest speakers we're really excited to hear from. I would like, first of all, to welcome Nina Malwani. Uh, Nina's a Year 12 student here at KG5, and she likes the idea of helping students think in a way that they can't be taught. I'm not sure whether that's a contradiction or not, but I like contradictions, and it's got me thinking already, um, Nina. Nina came third in the Young Founders competition a program that helps young people come up with ideas that are new and innovative. Uh, Nina's innovation in that competition was called Technovation, uh, which promoted women in technology, and that's got to be a good thing on both counts. So well done, Nina, and give her a round of applause, please. Has anyone here watched the TV show Weeds? If you have, then you'll know the theme song called Little Boxes. Let me quote you parts of the song. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky tacky, little boxes on the hillside, little boxes all the same. There's a green one, and a pink one, and a yellow one, and a blue one, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university, where they were put in boxes, and they came out all the same. And there's doctors, and there's lawyers, and there's business executives, and they're all made out of ticky tacky, and they all look just the same. This song talks about people all growing up the same way, following different paths, but still ending up exactly the same. This song represents what I'm going to be talking about today, and why young people need innovation in order to break this cycle. In school, we're taught subjects with the expectation and hope that the learning will lead to good grades, the good grades will lead us on to get a good degree, the good de degree is expected to le lead us on to get a good career path and earn good money. But if we all follow this pattern, how will we change the world? The world will be full of well-educated robots following the same path as their forefathers. When we're in middle school, we're all taught the same subjects until one day we get to high school and we start to hone in on different subject areas. Some people choose to do science, some stick to the arts, and some do psychology or business. And we may think that this is where we start to become unique, but that's not true at all. In middle school, high school, university, and even afterwards, we're taught all the same things, and we learn the same lessons from what we're taught. You study a certain subject under the impression that it will make you stand out, but in reality, there are thousands of people learning the exact same thing. Every year in maths class, there's always a kid that asks, but when are we ever going to use this in real life? And the teacher will say one of three things. One, this is real life. Two, in your exam. Or three, it's not the content that you're going to use, but it's the skills you obtain through working out the problems. But here's the thing. If we're all doing the same questions, then we're all solving the problem the same way. So when we're faced with a problem in real life, we'll all approach it the same way. That is why innovation is important for young people. By being innovative and forcing yourself to think outside of the box, you're learning how to solve problems in a way that can't be taught. If you're making an app or starting a business, you will come across problems. And you can't check for the answers at the back of your textbook when there's no textbook. You'll learn the importance of deadlines for making sure your business plan is complete or that your website is built. You'll learn perseverance when you don't reach specific goals. And you'll learn how to network instead of reading it about it in a textbook. You'll do all of this because you have a passion for what you're building. Here are some interesting facts. Only 30% of the students in the UK go to a school that offers computer science at GCSE. A report found that only 11% of these students actually took the subject, and only 20% of the candidates were female. So with all this in mind, I decided a GCSE in computer science would help me and make me quite unique. That's why I did it. Just in the UK, 666,751 students took the 2017 GCSE exams. I got a grade B, but 40% of the students who did this course got a grade B or higher. 
And that hardly puts me in a special group and would hardly make me especially appealing to university admission people nor to future prospective employers. But using some of the skills I learned in GCSE computer science to create an app for the Technovation competition put me in a more select group of kids and gave me an edge over the other computer science students. And I'm especially hoping it looks good on my university applications. So Technovation is an app building competition solely for girls. The guidelines for the app is that it must solve a community issue and fall, down, fall under le at least one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So that's fixing healthcare issues, education inequality, income inequality, or even just to help make people more active. Now I probably would have never made an app when I was just 16, but since one person decided that innovation is important and that they wanted to create a competition to promote it, I did create an app. Now we made it to the finals in Hong Kong, but didn't make it into the finals worldwide. But the team that did made a real made a real impact, positive impact on society because their app would help people get to the hospital quicker. Basically, their whole app idea was that it would show you the fastest hospital waiting times um, in addition to the fastest route to your hospital, including traffic. So anyone that was in pain could get to the hospital that would um, admit them quickest. That is why innovation is important for young people. Along our journey, we talked to powerful women who worked for Google and had degrees in computer science, and they all told us that you can't be successful unless you just go for it and innovate. And that's what we did. We were learning skills that the average computer science wouldn't, and we were creating things that our classmates wouldn't even begin to imagine. It was evident when we got back to the classroom as well. We would be writing some code for a hypothetical scenario, and I could figure out the solution much quicker than everyone else, because I was using the same skills that were built up while I was making something I was genuinely passionate about, rather than learning it because I needed to ace my exam. I also competed in a competition called Young Founders School. It's a weekend program run by Credit Suisse every year that promotes innovation by making us come up with a business idea, make a pitch deck, and pitch it all in one weekend. Our business idea had to be something that the community needed, something innovative. My idea was a sports subscription box. It was very simple. Every month, a customer would receive a box in the mail with lots of sports-related items. For example, a free trial to a yoga class, a new water bottle, and a supplement of your choice would be included one month. The next, it could be a sweatband, muscle relaxer, and a coupon for a free trial to a gym. Credit Suisse made, a, made us come up with out-of-the-box ideas to encourage innovation because they know that kids like that will be their best employees in the future. We presented our ideas to the investors and VPs at Credit Suisse offices on the 88th floor of Hong Kong's tallest building, and it was unreal. After that, the three best teams, which I'm thrilled to, thrilled to be one of, went on to pitch at Rise Tech Conference, a massive event where major tech companies and startups came to share their experiences and network. It was huge for me. I pitched my idea on stage to hundreds of people. Now, even though my passion isn't creating a sports subscription box or making an app, I've learned amazing things. And I've also grown into the person that I am today, and I love who I've become. And it's because of all of this that I'm more confident in myself and my ideas, which is very important for young people. I read an article in Bloomberg a few months ago that even banks are now looking for graduates with coding experience rather than, than just business school and MBA graduates. Employers now want people who are on the edge of innovation as they see the importance of innovation in young people. Now let me go back to education. Not all education is stuck in the old-fashioned book learning ways. The IB program, for example, is amazing because it, in order to complete the IB diploma, we have to do lots of CAS, which stands for Creativity, Activity, and Service. And we have to complete a CAS project that must include at least two of these strands. Another guideline is that we have to lead our own project and make sure that we organize everything. It forces us to be imaginative and come up with ideas that will help the community. This is a great example of modern educators realizing that innovation is important for young people, and book knowledge alone doesn't make us good future leaders. For new and innovative ideas, the younger is definitely the better. Why? Because young people have more free time. They don't need to worry about cooking dinner or other chores that many grown-ups spend time doing or worrying about. They have free time to imagine how the world could be different with some new idea. Teenagers look really busy with their heads in their phone all day long. Yes, it's true, a lot of that time is spent on social media. But contrary to popular belief that it is just a waste of time, it's actually inspiring us and helping us come up with new ideas. Young people haven't yet been indoctrinated to the acceptable norms of life. They are free spirits, rebellious by nature not because they disagree with the status quo, but because they don't know it yet. They're more willing to push the boundaries. They're also more in tune with the latest technology and can learn, can learn how to tweak it to suit themselves. For example, I used to play a game called Two Dots, and basically all you have to do is connect the dots. 
and there's a certain objective each level and if you fail the level you have to wait 20 minutes to get a new life so I thought what if I just change my phone time so that the app thinks it's been 20 minutes and I'll get a new life and it worked but my mom would just sit there for 20 minutes waiting for a new life to come along so this is why young kids need innovation. They need to have out-of-the-box thinking like this so they can solve their problems in a more proactive way. If you remember anything from this talk, remember this. No one ever remembers the guy that got 100% on all his exams. They remember the guy that did something with his life and made a positive change in the world. And that is why we need to encourage in young people so they can make a change that benefits society. Thank you. Thank you, Nita. I, I really like to start when she talked about how people live in boxes and we all look the same. And something I've noticed Hong, coming to Hong Kong, the diversity and the richness of Hong Kong society has been really enlightening for me to see the diversity. So that was really nice to hear. And, and then you talked about how sometimes we approach um, problems with the same solutions. And I feel like sometimes I get a bit institutionalised being a school teacher since I was 23. So maybe I should look out the box a bit more. And I, and I, I really like the idea about you talked about learning by doing when you create your own lap app and I think that's what makes you really special um, is how you go and learn by doing and you can feel the passion can't you? you can feel the energy you can feel the incitement in this young lady and I reckon I'll give you a job tomorrow in fact um, and I really like your confidence in front of a, an audience like this you told them how you outsmarted your mum I'd never tell my mum I'd outsmart her ever but you had the bravery to say how you tricked and outsmarted your mum that was fantastic so really enjoyed your talk Nina um, please another round of applause So our last speaker, uh, I'm really excited to hear from Pinder Wong. Thank you for coming in. Uh, Pinder is currently chairman of Verify, Hong Kong Limited. Uh, Pinder also serves on a variety of company boards and is a member of the Engineering Advisory Committee for Hong Kong University Science and Technology. Uh, Pinder has a long and distinguished involvement in business, in governance and digital technologies. Uh, Pinder graduated in 1992, still a young man, with first class honours um, in computing science from the Imperial College of London. But I think more prestigiously, he graduated from the Island School, ESF School, <laughs> in 1989. And even at higher accolade, he graduated from the Peak Primary School, Shh. top of the class, I reckon, in grade seven, six, um, in 1982. Not giving away your age at all, um, Pinder. Um, please make him feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for those remarks and congratulations to the ESF uh, 50. So I'm probably closer to that. And what, what, how, how does one follow Nina? Okay, what a speech like that. And I kind of you exhibit everything that uh, I want to talk about um, in my talk today, um, which is, if I may have my slide. Oh, sorry, next one. Is, um, you're a hacker, right? You hacked the system, right? She, she had this, this problem to solve and she changed the time on the system and so, so technically, you, you know, you're a bad girl, right? In the traditional way. So what I'm going to try to do is weave together some of the themes today regarding sort of success and failure, right? And fear or fear of success and all of that because they're actually all part of the same conversation. Now, what I would like to do is, is frame that in terms of the secret source, which is what I call yin-yang innovation, right? Easy to remember. Now... One of the things to succeed, um, I think, is to know that you have two quantum computers in your body. The first quantum computer is between your ears, and the second quantum computer is in your gut. In fact, both of them, we've just found out recently, have neurons, which are inside your brain. So with this quantum computer, one basically meditates. And I've been meditating on this symbol for about 30 years. Okay? So anyone know what this symbol actually represents? Right? They're the blueprints for an engine. This is a very special kind of engine, but it's the blueprints for an engine. And I call it basically a creation engine because it's this tension between good and bad, success and failure, love and fear, and all of that, which is actually the special source which drives innovation. Right? It drives the creativity and imagination which is increasingly what's going to differentiate us. So rather than hire her, you have to get in line behind me. Okay. So this tension um, 
is actually can be viewed negatively. It can be viewed as a sort of fundamentally in opposition to one each other. Now, like this, this chain and this rope, one can sort of pull at this two kingdom come, or one can think imaginatively about how would you change this tension into something useful? Anybody know? Well, the secret will be later. But you spin it. You don't put it in opposition. You use this tension between light and dark, top and bottom, left and right, male and female, gay or straight, whatever, into becoming a spin. Because this engine spins. Now, in island school and in peak school, we used to play a game called table soccer with a coin, which is you, you hit it with a coin and it goes across. And the first thing you do is you have to solve a basic problem, which is a riddle. And a riddle is how, do you, how many sides are there to a coin? And how do you balance a coin on its, well, actually, there are three sides to the coin. I've given it away. There's the head, tail, and the edge. So how do you, the, the riddle is how do you balance this coin on its edge? What do you do? You, you spin it, right? So what appears unstable, if you spin it fast enough, it becomes stable. So that's somewhat the secret of innovation is to recognize that things are in tension to one another, right? The existing system and the future system, right? The borders which you didn't know about and bumbled into, breaking convention. The status quo versus the new generation. The old versus the young. So this tension is uh, what I want you to keep in mind and how we can turn it to spin because we're all searching for stability, right? The future is all unknown. We all face an uncertain future. So with it that, we try and grasp this little life ring of stability. And we believe that in my day, you had a choice, become you know, doctor or lawyer, choose one, right? And I dropped out, actually, after I got this first class honors, supposedly, I was a good student. I got this Sir Edward Ude Fellowship and blah, blah, blah. And then I kind of threw that all away in the PhD. I started my PhD before doing a master's. And I threw that all away, in fact, to work with my husband's supervisor to found the first licensed ISP in Hong Kong. So I, yes, I helped introduce the internet here in 1993. That was bad boy. I chucked all away my education, so to speak, and then got on this wild ride. This is before the web. And so do you know why we surf the internet? We don't swim the internet. We don't sail the internet. It's because this ra the pace of change, this constant churn of innovation, which on the outside is you know, really quite scary. There is no hope that you're going to actually charge your way through that because the ground and, or the water beneath you just changes all the time. So the best you can do is have a compass of roughly where you want to go and you surf. You don't sort of throw caution to the wind. You just kind of go with it, right? You just do it, right? Or just done it, or one of the two, okay? So when you have a tension, spin it. How do you spin it? So there's two kinds of innovation, right? Kaizen, which is, you know, Japan and, 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 and Korea mastered this, right? This is Japan just in time manufacturing. Linear incremental improvements, very low risk, but you do that over a long arc of time and you produce really world-class products. Linear incremental. And then there's another kind, which is breakthrough innovation, right? This is, this is, this is the bit that's interesting, right? Because we're no longer looking at 30, 50, 100% improvement. We're looking at a 1,000x, 10,000x improvement. And you're not going to get there from here. So the two different kinds, again, not saying one is better than the other, yum yang, right? Yin yang. One is linear incremental. One is super exponential and, and high risk. So which one is most suited to you? I don't know. But what I do know is that there's fundamental tension. So in my day, the tension was between the telephone companies and this thing was called the internet, right? And, 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 you know, we had a thing called, you know, long-distance phone calls. You might remember, right? You, you pick up the phone, you call some long-distance uh, country, and you bleed money, literally. You just kind of just bleed it. It would go out your hands. But nowadays, we open these apps, and we leave video on. We stream it all over the world, and nobody cares, and it's free. So who could have predicted that? I don't know. Because the question here is, could you have predicted that? I don't think you could have. So what I'm also questioning is, well, we're going to have to be very question in the world that's coming, where we have genomics, AI, robotics, big data, all of these innovations all happening at the same time. How are they going to be combined? How are they going to coalesce? Does anybody know? I don't think so. Right? But we will still need ethics, which I'll get to in a second. 
All right, so the telephone system, it managed to extend two of our basic senses, our ears and our mouth, around the world. Now, the Internet effectively extended our eyes and our minds anywhere in the world. And that was a big deal. And now with the Internet of Things and robotics, we are now connecting this all together that is extending literally our hands, but also our hearts. What we intend to do with this technology, right? Ethical-driven innovation. Do we use synthetic life or biohacking? Do we create a virus which no one has ever seen before? You know, we have the technology of gods, but the responses of Neanderthals with, art, with, art, with, with institutional systems that are medieval. Right? So we're going to have facing many challenges, and we don't know what those are. So just as Nina said that you're going to have to make it up and going along, you're going to have to parlay the same skills that you didn't know you had. You're going to have to basically try, not be afraid of failure, because failure is what? Failure is learning. Right? That's what our ancestors did. That's what we need to continue to do. So this was the Internet. Right? That was it. Everyone knew each other. And now there's some 60 different thousand networks. So who could have predicted that this sort of research project, which was just sort of knitting, is now the infrastructure of infrastructures, right? Humble beginnings. And it wasn't the network that was supposed to begin. It was, wasn't the network that was supposed to win. But what it could do and the telephone system couldn't do is it could out-evolve. Now, if we learn to learn anything from Darwin, it's not necessarily the strongest or the fittest that survive. It is the most adaptable. So it's actually the rate, again, the spin, which is important, right? In technology, we talk about agile, how fast, you know, we sort of move fast, break things, right? Move fast, break things, but learn from that and do that as fast as possible. Spin it, because if you can do that, you will learn faster, real life lessons, which can then be parlayed into something else. So this is what I call bad girl or bad boy technology, right? It wasn't the, techno the technology that was supposed to win. It's not necessarily the one that's institutionalized. It's probably the one which is least likely or least observed to have a potential future. The internet wasn't supposed to, to win, but it had better economics and could out-evolve. And many of you know that I'm a big proponent of Bitcoin, uh, which, which is, again, another one of these very odd technologies. So the telephone system had one assumption, and if you understood that this assumption was going to be fundamentally changed, you could have made a tremendous amount of, op of money, actually. But you would have to have the, the vision, the observation, and also put that into action. And this equation, sorry, a little bit of math, very simple, is that distance equals cost, right? Long distance phone call. You made a long distance phone call, the assumption is you're going to bleed money because it's long distance. It's a long way between here and, you know, America or London. But we basically destroyed that. We challenged the assumption that distance does not equal cost. And that's, in some sense, how the internet won. But that required a different philosophy. In the old days, this stratagem was used for several hundred years, and it kind of worked. It was called divide and conquer. Right? You put a little seed of doubt, and you kind of just win by just compartmentalizing everyone and overwhelm them. For the last 25 years, we've been using a different strategy, which is not divide and conquer. It's, not, it's called connect and liberate. Different way of thinking, different philosophy. And if you understood that, again, you would understand of why we have all these social networks. and Because what they're doing is they're connecting us and they're liberating the value, right? And it's not all social networks. There is great imagination and creativity and hunger for more knowledge, right? That is, that is also fostering. It's also the difference between systems that are open and closed. Systems which are open can evolve. We are no longer a, play, a borrowed place on borrowed time. We're still very open. We're one of the freest and open economies. And yet, this, this paradox, we're also part of China, which is arguably a closed system. So Hong Kong is important, and the reason why the ESF is important is because we live this, 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 this paradox, right? Now, we also have a problem. The Internet's great. We connect everything with one each other. And, and previously, geography was destiny. Now, topology or technology is destiny. In the old days, you couldn't divorce your neighbor. Right? Nowadays, everyone is your neighbor on the Internet, and everywhere is potentially a, a bad neighborhood. 
So there's a downside to the internet as well. But the cybersecurity domain, I've just come back from India where we were talking about this, is that the assumption is centralized equals secure. If I build a wall high enough, a firewall high enough, and a moat wide enough, I will be secure. And yet we have these constant leaks and breaks. So there was one this morning with respect to, what was that service which is against the law in Hong Kong? Uber, right? Uber had, I don't know how many, 50 million, 60 million of all your privately identifiable information is now somewhere on the internet. Good luck with getting that back. So Bitcoin and these bad boy technologies, bad girl technologies, are different by design. They do not assume that centralized is, is secure. It is, assumes the opposite. Spread your data anywhere and everywhere. There is no center to attack. Again, changing assumptions. Now, Bitcoin is also another example of changing another assumptions. And Hong Kong is a major financial center, right? And ever since I was a young boy, I've been told, time is money, right? Time is money. Well, Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency is the first example of actually data equals money. And this morning at 64,000 Hong Kong dollars per Bitcoin. Yes, it has done very well. If you could see the opportunity five years ago and buy a boatload of it. So what, is the, what, is the, what am I trying to say here? I'm trying to say, well, look, there's going to be good and bad. You are actually all perfect as you are, right? You just have to see it that way. But you have to forgive the mistake and learn the lesson. It is not necessarily the fear of success, right, or the fear of failure. Either way, you can harness it as long as you don't put it in direct opposition with, 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 with each other. So what I said to the island school people is, is kind of a little riff off the tech which is you've got to think big, your ideas, right? The best advice I was given is when you dream, dream big. Nothing worse than a, than a coward dreamer. By definition, they're a dream. So think big. What's the worst that can happen? Start small and spin fast because that's what will be your, what's stable to you. Now getting here, just as an example, they wouldn't let me in. My name wasn't registered. My car park was there. I put my foot through a nail. Pinder doesn't necessarily pin the foot, the nail through the foot, right, last week. And so I dumped my car down the road and I hobbled here. And that's kind of what I'm trying to say, which is resilience is really what is it all about. So what I learned in high school, an apology to my English teacher, is something that is a bit of a mantra to me, and I would like to share that with you. Um, it's a poem called Invictus, and it goes something like this. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods there be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I did not wince nor cried aloud under the bludgeonings of chance. My head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years, finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with circumstance the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Thank you very much. So thank you, Pinder. Uh, I thought that was fascinating. I don't know about anybody else. Uh, I love the opening when he talked about two computers in our body. One is our brain and the other one is our gut. And how many times we say in the past, you know, what the gut feeling. And I think the new science around that now is saying that, well, there actually is, there is a, one. Bra a brain in our there stomach that's telling us and it goes back to Neanderthal days. Indeed. Um, and I really like that idea too that we've got a, you know, we've got tools of gods and the responsibility like Neanderthal. So it's a bit of a scary thought, that one, but hopefully we can get through it. What, what I got there, though, I thought maybe your, your message today was a bit of a metaphor for these young people here. Um, the idea of, of, you know, not having a job for life but a life for the job of the project and, and how you're going to have to spin, spin, spin and go from one job to the other and that's how you're going to find your stability and, and being like this young lady here who, who's agile, who's smart, who's proactive, who can, and who can learn by doing, you're going to be spinning through your life and in that way you're going to find stability. So I took a lot of meaning out of, out of that there. So again, Pinder, thank you so much. Thank really you. insightful work. I've got a little certificate if I can sneak past. Oh, the Hong Kong handshake. We have a certificate culture. I made it. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right.
Um, just in closing, again, I just want to really briefly Thanks. pick on a couple of Pinder's words. I love the last one. It said, forgive the mistake, um, learn the lesson. And I think that's sort of summed up, I think, what, what the theme was today, that we've got so much to, to learn and, and so much not to fear. And if we learn by doing, we can make incredible things. Um, I think today represented what we stand for as a brand, what we stand for as ESF. Um, it's about innovation. It's about young people. It's about collaboration. It's about... Um, taking on the future with a uh, degree of optimism and resilience and as a, as a, as a learning organisation um, trying to prepare, uh, prepare our young people for the future, our young people that we can't predict, sorry, a future we can't predict, um, or we know it's going to be different, fundamentally different. So it gives me optimism at events like this that we're getting our young people to think um, what skills they need to be successful and I think that's what our brand's about is um, preparing our people for the future. On closing, I'd really like to thank... Um, the people who put this together, um, particularly Terry April and her team from ESF. Can you give them a round of applause, please? <laughs> Our absolutely awesome, and I'll, I'll get a Christmas card and maybe a hug for you guys. Thank you, Charles. Um, our um, Yasmin, Azraf, um, Clara Learn and Joanne Law, and our awesome AV boys, Martin and Mohawk, the stars of the school, m and Can you give them a round of applause, please? Um, thank you so much for putting together tonight. I, I've had a terrific afternoon considering it was four o'clock to six o'clock, wherever it is. I'm, I'm feeling really inspired. Um, I'm going to have to go home, have a cup of tea, have a lie down, not fear my wife, look at myself in the mirror and have an even better day tomorrow. So thank you so much. Um, please travel safe and thank you for coming tonight.